Hey, Julian, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you for being here. Um, you're in Malaysia right now, so the feed may be a little bit um, fuzzy, but thank you for staying up late uh, <laughs> to be with us. And uh, we're going to talk about Reef Check today. You're, you're with Reef Check Malaysia. And uh, let's right. tell everybody what Reef Check's all about. Well, for those of you out there who don't know what it is, Reef Check is basically a coral reef monitoring program. Um, it's the name both of the organization, Reef Check, and it's the name of the coral reef monitoring methodology that we use. Um, it was established back in about 1996 by a bunch of coral reef scientists who designed a methodology to be used by non-scientists. So effectively what we can do is we can get certified leisure divers who are reasonably experienced and reason reasonably observant to get trained upon the methodology and then they can help us to do the surveys. So we have a whole army of volunteers out there to help the relatively small number of marine biologists that we have in Malaysia. ReefCheck is, has about 80 plus countries where it has a presence. But I'm, ah, well, we have a, we have a, we have a publicity problem, obviously. Uh, I'm only in charge of ReefCheck. Um, we have good relationships with ReefCheck in Thailand, uh, just to the north of us, Singapore to the south, and then Philippines and Indonesia, the other main uh, coral triangle countries. So we know the people there, we know their programs, and we do talk to each other, but each individual country is run as a separate entity. So you train divers, but how do you do that? Do you, you team up with uh, uh, local businesses? How do you do it? We uh, we do it two ways. One is we do some of the training ourselves. My own staff actually go out into the field and do training. But the other is we also work with a few dive centers in Malaysia who we have trained up to deliver courses themselves. So uh, we have, I think, 15 partner centers at the moment around Malaysia. And some of them, two or three of them, are actually offering reef check courses themselves. Uh, the rest of it we do the training. So. So ReefCheck has, has uh, how many divers now in Malaysia? How many divers have you put through this program? About 600. 600, and it's all over Malaysia. So do you think this is valuable to um, dive centers to become involved in, in a program like this? Do, do dive centers feel it's valuable to become involved? Um, I, <laughs> I, I hope so. Uh, I use it. I used to be a dive center myself. I used to run a dive center on one of the islands off of Tiamans, uh, of Malaysia's east coast, uh, an island called Tiaman Island. And I lived there for about six years, which is how I found out about Reef Check and got involved in it. Um, and then when I left the island and moved back to Kuala Lumpur, then I got involved with Reef Check and I just got more and more and more involved and now I run it. So we've been running a, a full-time program since 2007, which is the period during which we've, uh, we've trained those divers. Um, and as a dive center operator, I was interested in conservation, and I found that a small proportion of dive centers here are also interested in conservation, sadly only a small proportion. Um, and so those are the ones we work with. We work with the community of the willing, the, the community of the willing. Sorry, the, uh, we just had a break there. What, what did you do? You work with the what? We work with the community of the willing. We cannot the community make dive of the centers willing. work. Okay. <laughs> we cannot make dive centers work for us or with us, uh, but we, we try to find the ones that are interested and see the benefits and who are interested to help out, uh, and we work with them. So, um, how does how does your program uh, how does it differentiate itself? I know there's a number of programs out there. What do you at Reef Check do that um, kind of excites divers to get involved as opposed to other programs that are going on? I think the main difference between us and the other monitoring programs that are out there, and there are there are two or three other monitoring programs for non scientists. Okay, this is for non scientists but they don't really deliver quantitative data. Whereas we have an annual survey program going back to 2007 of Malaysia's reefs. We started off with 30 sites and we now have nearly 200, uh, which we've been monitoring every year. 
And we, we are able to report our data back as scientifically valid data. So it goes to the Department of Marine Parks, it goes to the Ministry of Environment, um, it goes to the International Reef Base database. So it's basically, it's scientifically valid. That's the difference because the other stuff that's out there is perceptional data. It's, do you think there are a lot of fish? Do you think there's a lot of hard coral? But ours is quantifiable and comparable with previous years. So this must go into a much larger database, not just in Fifth Malaysia, but, uh, but the Coral Triangle database. It goes to, well, it, we, we ourselves pull together a regional report for uh, Southeast Asia. So we've just uh, finished that for 2014. We've also just finished our Malaysia National 2014 report writing. And all of the data for those two go into ReefBase, which is an international database on coral reef monitoring, coral reef health. So this is a this is a hugely valuable thing. It, it's it surprises me that uh, um, there's not a groundswell of support from business to to get involved in this because people want to do really amazing things underwater. They want to contribute. So can you tell me some wins? Uh, can you tell me some some of the people who have gotten involved as businesses uh, what they've been doing? The business involvement we've had is. I guess from two main areas. One is the dive centers themselves who got involved. Um, <clears throat> and there are a few of them which are, how can I put this, they're green businesses. They recognize the need to be environmentally conscious. Um, I'm thinking of operators who have done other programs themselves. So there's one in East Malaysia on the island of Mabul called Uber Junkie. And they have a program to conserve turtles on the island. They have a program to work with the village to improve waste management on the island. Uh, they work with the school on the island. So they recognize that these things are necessary, but they also have a dive master program, which turns out uh, ecologically aware dive, dive, dive masters. So they're all trained to be reef check divers. Uh, they've all got experience in surveys. And Scuba Junkie thinks this gives them a business edge, as long as it being the right thing to do. Um, that's one example. There are others as well that are, you know, involved. Not not all to the same degree, but some of them are seeing it as a business benefit. So that's one is the diving industry. So the other side is our corporate sponsors. Most of our funding comes from corporate sponsors, uh, largely out of budgets like corporate social responsibility. Uh, some of it's communications, corporate communications. They call it different things, but it's basically CSR type funding. Um, and some of them have worked with us for a number of years now. So uh, KPMG, the big uh, consulting and contracting company, uh, co 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 consulting company, has been working with us since 2007. And every year they train a few of their staff and they send them out to the island and they survey their two survey sites. So they have these sites that they've been monitoring since 2007. And they get a benefit from that because the people that want to work for the KPMGs of the world want more than just a salary, they want a company that's doing something and so it helps them with staff recruitment and retention. That's, that's, this uh, so is great there's, news. There's a direct business benefit. Yeah. And other sponsors, um, I'm thinking of Malaysian companies for example who send their staff out to participate in launch events for reef rehabilitation programs or send their staff to help with education programs on the island schools. They get a kick out of spending three days on the island, running around with the young eleven-year-olds on the islands, and you know, playing, playing, playing kid, but playing adult, and being the, being the supporter of the whole program, and facilitating small groups and so on, and and that helps with staff. It's a staff team building thing. It's confidence building. It's all sorts of things. So, there are some companies that are getting involved. Yeah. This is this is really exciting. This is putting a whole new. Uh, um complexion on what it's like to run a dive center, to, to have these seemingly um, uh, completely separate businesses all of a sudden now becoming involved. I, I used to work at a consulting firm, a big consulting firm, and, and I, I know how important it is for this corporate social responsibility. Uh, it's, it's a big thing now for big companies. And uh, to have you tap into their need to 
show their corporate uh, social responsibility, not just to um, the, the c- communities that they work in, but also to their own people. Um, this, is, this is brilliant. This is, this is really brilliant. I'm very excited about this. Now, um, I wanted to ask you, um, say Scuba Junkie, how has that impacted the area that they work in? How, how has Reef Check kind of um, um, ingratiated them with the community? Um, how's, how does it, does it attract more divers to their, their store, their operation? Uh, what, what kinds of off, you know, sort of these, these uh, ripple effects um, are they experiencing? I, I don't want to claim too much of it as the credit for, for ourselves because they, they've done a lot of this them, themselves. I mean, they have a, the, all of their grey water in the resort is recycled through a reed bed tire system. They don't have to do that. Nobody else on the island is doing that, but they took the initiative to do it. Just about thing. But from our perspective, one is their eco-diver, uh, eco-diver dive master program. So all of their dive masters are trained as eco-divers. And apparently they tell me that having that additional certification as part of the dive master course uh, does attract people to the to the to the course. Um, also, they find that being being able to present themselves as an environmentally friendly organisation does bring benefits. It does bring in more business. Um, so they have the programmes they run on the island. They talk about what they do with reef check to their customers. It's on their website. So it's a definite it's a definite business benefit for them, as well as being a great help to us because it's like from where we are in KL, it's in the middle of nowhere. And for me to send people out there and do surveys is very expensive. They help us with the surveys, so it cut, cuts my costs as well. And and so Scuba Junkie is is a, a beautiful example. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna find them. I'm gonna track them down and talk to them. Uh, so thanks for the heads up on that. Now, not naming any names, but um, who are the bad boys out there? What are they not doing or doing? So what we have here in Malaysia is we have two different types of market. We have Peninsula Malaysia, which is uh, largely, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger volume market. Um, it's on, the diving is on islands where there are numerous resorts and dive centers. So Tiamen Island, there are 60 resorts and 15 dive centers. And they all compete with each other for the customer. And we have the whole tragedy of the common situation Nobody wants to do anything because he's not doing something. Why should I do something when they're not doing something? That's the situation in uh, Peninsula Malaysia, and it's something that I dealt with when I had my dive center here, um, and which we are working against as much as we can. We're trying to get over it by just continually trying to involve people. So where Scuba Junkie are is in East Malaysia, which is on the island of Borneo, and over there, it's much lower volume of resorts per island. A lot of those places it's maybe one resort per island, two resorts per island. So there's a lot more incentive to look after the reefs that you dive immediately and regularly because they're yours and you want them to be in good condition. So if you like the where we're getting perhaps the least resonance is in the peninsular islands where the competition's greater and there's more of a sense of it's somebody else's problem to fix. Whereas if it's a, a resort that's on its own and they've got their own reef to look after, then they can say, this is my reef, I need to protect it for my customers. Um, and there's another example of a resort called Lankayan, which established its own marine protected area in order to protect the reefs around the resort, because without the reefs, it's got no customers. So there's a business man who's seeing a direct link between conservation and, uh, and, and, uh, and business. Right, so so basically, where there's a lot of competition, it's much more difficult to uh, for Reef Check to kind of uh, uh, partner uh, with with those dive operators because they're too busy duking it out um, and they don't see the point. But when a dive operator is much more connected to the reef and uh, they they see it as their reef. Um, they're, they are much more likely to be much more ecologically responsible, but probably much more likely to tee up with you. Yes, in a nutshell. That's a generalization like everything. You know, there are dive operators on, in Peninsula that are more helpful, and there are dive operators in East Malaysia who really don't care. But as a, as a rule, that's kind of how it spreads out. So what's... Um, I, I, I didn't have this on my list of questions for you, but this just came up for me, and um, we can uh, talk about it or not. But um, 
what's happening with uh, uh, Sipadan, Sipadan, or whatever, whoever, you know, there's different ways of pronouncing it. What's going on there now? Um, what's going on at Sipadan is that there is still a limited number of divers allowed per day. So there are a number of licenses, I think it's 140 a day, it's either 120 or 140, I can't remember. Um, and that is quite closely managed by Sabah Parks, who are the management authority for the state of Sabah. Uh, the licenses are spread around various dive operators on the nearby islands, um, and they are fiercely fought over. Well, not fought over, but they are used every day, they're used. So there is great demand for Sipadan permits. So Sipadan was in a situation, I was there in the 90s, I was fortunate uh, to go there and it was incredible. There were two resorts there at the time, very, very rustic and uh, it was beautiful. But I guess since then Sipadan was loved uh, too much <laughs> and um, how, I want to know, considering there's a lot of operators, well certainly for, for such a remote place, there are a lot of operators there. How do you think that they they all got on the same page to uh, protect Sipadan and and uh, not have the tragedy of the commons uh, carry itself out? They they brought it back to something that was manageable and everybody was on the same playing field. What did they do? It was uh, actually it was external forces. There was a kidnapping event in the early 2000s, about 2000 actually, uh, a number of people were taken away for a long period of time and the government decided that the security situation on such a remote island was too risky for them to have resorts so they closed down all the resorts and they then decided to issue the same number of permits that there were rooms on the island so they have, that, that was a clever step because that meant that they that could not increase the number of divers going to, island, to the island above what was possible before of people staying on it. So all the resorts were moved off, I think in about 2002, and uh, they issued the same number of permits as they had before. So, and, and they've retained the same system to date. This is, this is fascinating. I, I hadn't realized um, that was the, it was an outside force. It was actually a, a crisis situation um, that got everybody um, thinking about this, not just thinking about it, they had to do something. And, and they did it, but it, it, it wasn't actually the state of the, uh, the reef, which I know is starting to, to look a little bit on the worse for wear side. It was actually this, this kidnapping uh, scenario. Wow. I wonder, I wonder what um, crisis situations we're going to have to go through uh, for our oceans, for people to just stop and reevaluate how we're, how we're abusing our our blue planet and that that's that's a question that I want to ask you as well um, so you're even though you're a nonprofit you are definitely in the dive industry you work with dive dive organizations divers are in the dive industry so you work with directly with divers what do you think our industry as a whole um, what is um, our industry's responsibility for all of these ocean issues that we're dealing with right now well, first of all, I have to say, I don't think you'll get many divers who recognize a connection between coral reefs and the global ocean, right? So if you want to look at all of the ocean issues there are, like overfishing on sea mounts, uh, the four undersea mining that's going to be starting up before too long, divers don't really associate with those because they don't see them. So for divers, it's coral reefs, not oceans. That's the first thing I have to say. Um, but that aside... Um, Honestly, I do not know what is going to move them. It's going to have to take either another crisis, which I'd rather not have, or much more effective regulation and legislation and lobbying to understand the problems and to take action on those problems. Um, and I say that because I don't see dive operators, particularly in the competitive areas, Taking, taking the steps necessary. We were involved in some research done at the end of 2012-2013 on some of the islands in Malaysia and in Thailand and Indonesia uh, that was looking at the economic impact of the coral bleaching of 2010. And it turns out that the dive centers, a lot of them were saying, well, even if it bleaches again, and even if all the corals die, and it gets taken over by algae, 
it doesn't matter because most of our customers are new divers and they don't know what a coral reef looks like so if it's covered in algae that's what a coral reef, coral reef looks like to them so that's kind of tragic but that's the way they see it they're businessmen um, but I do think there are things that can be done and it's a question of building the right consensus to make it happen and I've just been having this discussion with some colleagues um, I think dive industry, dive centers should be more involved in conservation not a, not necessarily taking conservation actions themselves because there isn't that much they can do but they can lobby government to make changes to MPAs uh, to the management of MPAs um, we, we tend to divide threats to coral reefs into two we divide them, we, we call them the the global threats, which is global warming, possible climate change, ocean warming, ocean acidification. As a local manager, there's nothing we can do about that, realistically. We cannot, I cannot stop carbon emissions, can't do it. Then we have the local threats, which is the things that are affecting the coral reefs on a local basis. Uh, sewage pollution from resorts, uh, trash from boats, anchors, diver damage, snorkel damage. All of these things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis on the reef itself. The dive centers have got a, a big role to play in that. They can supervise their divers better, they can train their divers better, they can train their boatmen better, they can make sure they use mooring lines. There's so much they can do, but more then relies on the government to then manage the MPA itself better. So do we need more restriction of diver numbers in our MPAs, for example, such as Sipadan? Do we need to look at sites and say, this site can only manage 100 people a day? And then we start to issue permits on a, on a broader basis like that. So these questions can also, these, these, these things can also help to reduce the local impacts which will build the health of the reef so it's resilient to the global impacts that we can't do anything about. So we're talking about building reef resilience through better MPA, MPA management, better diver management, snorkel management and addressing all, all of those local problems that are facing the reefs now. So, so with your eco um, dive master program, uh, do you teach uh, the ocean issues uh, that we are facing right now as part of that eco diver program? As part of the eco diver program, um, we when we certify people to help us to conduct uh, coral reef surveys, we do talk about issues affecting coral reefs and, and near coastal areas. Uh, so, uh, overfishing, fish bombing. Reefs, Thoughts and so on, too many divers, sedimentation from resort development and so on, all of those things. We do talk about those. We don't talk about the bigger ocean issues, you know, the, the seamounts and the undersea mining. Those are beyond our control and they're outside of our sphere of influence. So, as I said just now, a lot of divers, there's a disconnect between ocean and coral reef. Hmm. This is, you know, it's funny because we're in this, so we, we uh, it's, it kind of shocks me when I hear that people are so disconnected, but clearly they are because this is the state of our ocean. We are, we are disconnected. So what you're doing is at least starting to get people connected to the reefs that they love and starting to understand that whole ecosystem so that they'll, 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 they'll see that, that they need to make better choices and when things aren't going properly if somebody's dragging an anchor or uh, kicking up sediment or whatever it might be uh, these things these things are addressed do you think that um, we as I mean we're the dive industry is an education industry it's 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 all about you know uh, it's a big education is a big portion of it I should say it's, there's experience you know we want to give people experiences but there's a big portion that is about education because um, every experience is an education do, do you think we should be reaching out a little bit further and, 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 and starting to talk about uh, uh, carbon uh, fuels and, and that kind of, kind of thing? Because when divers leave the resort area, they go back home and they, they drive their car. And um, it would seem to me that they could have some impact even just signing uh, petitions uh, to help uh, with these global problems that we're dealing with. What do you Could. think? Good, yes. Um, and I've been arguing recently with other colleagues that the dive industry could have a role in taking motivated 
passionate people who are motivated and passionate about diving and, and giving them a broader conservation message. So getting them. Um, I've been arguing with colleagues recently that there is a potential for the dive industry to get these passionate, interested divers to be more widely involved in conservation issues. But it's a big, it's a big could be because you say that education is involved in the diving industry. I don't think I don't know about that. I think there's a lot of certification involved in the dive industry, but I'm not sure much how much education the dive industry feels it's responsible for. It's one thing to certify somebody as an open water diver. It's another thing because it's not included in the course to teach them not to fit against a safety bottom, not to break corals with their fins. It is not part of the certification courses, and it's not part of the course taught by most instructors. This is. That's taught by instructors. You have to go and have a photo like that. And then that's it, you're a diver, game over. But in terms of getting people seriously involved in conservation and understanding the ecosystem, I don't think it's part of the ethos of the diving industry, most of them. Could it be? Yes. But it would need Paddy and Naui and SSI and all the other guys to take a step and say, okay, saving sharks is one thing, but we have a bigger message to, to give than we are doing at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I just talked to uh, Doug McNeese at SSI and uh, he, he was he was pretty hard hitting on on his his views of uh, the training as it stands now. He's, he's disappointed in it. And and the SSI is taking steps to uh, pump up the training so that people will understand a lot more be more comfortable in the water. So there'll be less diver damage and be um, more aware of the environment that they're, they're, they're you know, partaking in. Uh, he knows that the industry, the certification industry, is not doing nearly enough, and uh, it's showing in the certifications. So uh, this, is, this is a big area that, that we all need to be aware of. You're, you're so right. I love what you said, that uh, it's, it's about certifications and not necessarily about education. Uh, this, is, this is a very, very... Uh, big this is a big issue <laughs> and and you said it so succinctly so in in terms of reef checks next next steps what are you planning on doing what what are your next big initiatives out there in Malaysia um, we've spent the last seven eight years building up our programs and our credibility with government. In, uh, in Southeast Asia you have to work with governments. Um, we, we cannot waltz up to an island and say okay we declare this a marine park uh, uh, and we're now going to manage this marine protected area and it's ours. We don't have the authority to do that. We have to work with the nominated management authority. So we work with the Department of Marine Parks and we now I think we have a good relationship with them and they, they trust us because we don't go shouting to the media when something goes wrong. We share our data with them, we try to work with them, and over time they have become more willing to listen to new ideas, not just from ourselves, but from other people. You know, marine science is moving on all the time. Understandings of how MPAs actually work is moving on all the time. What is an MPA? Is it a protected area? Is it a protected area? Is it a no-take area? All of these things, the understanding of these is moving on all the time. And I think now we are in a position to work with the government on some new initiatives to establish new MPAs which are going to look different from the existing ones. And they're going to work better because they're designed better from the bottom up, right from the beginning. Instead of being imposed, it's like, okay, this is an area that we need to protect. How do we do it? Let's get all of the stakeholders involved. Let's have a discussion about it and see what's the best way way to protect this particular bit of real estate because it's different from that one over there so we have to do something different here um, and I think in the next year or two we're going to have two or three of these opportunities come up which could create major change to marine parks management in, uh, in Malaysia. Marine parks, MPAs, it's all the same thing, they call them marine parks here. Um, and I think that's going to be terribly important in pushing, advocating for, for marine conservation because it's the, it's the framework that we have for it to make it work. So you're not going to tip your hand yet, are you? Can you give us like just a little sneak peek of the kinds of things that you are going to do um, to create a better um, marine protected area? Um, I, can't, I can't talk specifically about where it is because it, we haven't actually started the government consultations yet, but 
There is an area of reef uh, off the coast of the uh, peninsula of Malaysia which is currently unprotected for a variety of good historical reasons, um, but due to uh, developments in the area, the local community is being deprived of its, some of its traditional fishing grounds. So we are saying, why not establish a recreational fishing industry here for this community? And if you're going to do that, then you have to protect their recreational fishing area. So how do we do that? How do we do that in consultation with the fishermen who go through that area on the way to their fishing grounds? And how do we do it in consultation with the ferry boat operators who want to move through the same area? So everybody needs to be talked to, including the state government, the federal government, um, the fisheries department, lots and lots of different stakeholders. But the difference in approach is that the federal government is not just coming along and saying that's now a one-size-fits-all ring pop. It's going to be different. This, um, it, it's a funny thing because people think that, you know, the uh, marine parks areas should have no fishing. And this is something that uh, it's really important to, to uh, uh, bring to light is that artisanal fisheries um, go a long way to protect the area. And... Uh, all of this is all about coastal management, right? It's it's this is the only way to protect our reefs is to uh, to really take a look at coastal management. And if you have huge commercial fisheries going in there, yes, it's going to wipe things out. But if you're talking about artisanal fisheries, uh, fisheries that um, are very careful about taking care of their area, uh, then this type of activity. Um, which seems to be extractive, it is, but it is very careful. Um, you can actually protect uh, the reefs, and and you have a big problem where you are. You have fish bombing. So so so, can you tell me um, how that's affecting the dive industry there? Well, he's killing the reefs. <laughs> um, there are large areas of uh, the coastline where you just wouldn't bother going diving anymore. Now, fortunately, it's not the key diving areas. Uh, there are large areas of the coastline which are uh, which are also undeveloped. So, as far as we know, there could be good areas of reef out there that people just haven't been to look at yet. But yes, it has an impact. I mean, it is degrading the reefs, and it is something we need to do something about. But you look back at the people who can actually have an impact on that and it has to go back to government because they're the ones with the big boats, with the men with the guns who can arrest people. All I can do is do awareness raising with local communities and explain to them how it's going to affect their future and their children's future. But at the end of the day, if that's not backed up with enforcement, I'm really wasting my breath. But I want to come back to the point you were making about artisanal fishing. Um, I think it's pretty widely accepted now for Malaysia, that the way that they set up their marine parks, which is to say two nautical miles closed zone, um, 21 years ago, uh, was perhaps not the best way it could be done because that also excluded the local populations from fishing in that marine park. And of course, they weren't very happy about that because they've been fishing there for generations. So you immediately had a, a, a situation of conflict between the management and the local population. And that's one of the things that we're looking to try and change when we introduce new approaches to establishing what we'll call protected areas and managed areas uh, as, as we move forward. And I want to move away from the whole no-take zone, protected area. Protect, people don't like protected areas. They get all antsy. You talk to a fisherman about protected areas. Oh, no, we can't talk about protected areas. Okay, let's call it a managed area. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means bits of it you can still fish in, but bits of it you've got to protect. So if I allow you to fish here, then you agree you're not going to fish there? It's the start of a conversation anyway, which is not being done before. Um, but back to the fish bombing. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was going to go back to the fish bombing. It is an intractable problem. We're working with an organization in Hong Kong that's putting, giving us fish detector technology. We're working with communities in a couple of places. WWF is working with communities, with a couple, in, with communities in a couple of places. It's still going on. The only way to stop it is a joint effort by ourselves and the police and the enforcement agencies to actually go after these guys and catch them. We, we can't do much more. Right. Well, it's, uh, your, this whole discussion is really goes back to the, you know, the sustainability model, right? You know, you've got, you're working with this, the social aspect. The only way to protect the reefs is to include uh, the local communities. Um, if they're left out, there's conflict and, and that doesn't work. You have to use the right wording 
you can't say no take zone. <laughs> you know these. The, you know the the making sure you're using the right words uh, is is so important. You know and and de- the the regulation, the whole regulation aspect of things, and developing trust because things only move as fast as as trust. So you have to create the trust with the, the local communities and the trust with the government. And then you're doing all this environmental work, you know, with the reef monitoring, with the divers, and really having a good baseline data that which is which is used at a much broader scale. And then you've got businesses who are already committed to this, who um, are benefiting. So as a as a beginner model, um, because Malaysia's, um, you know, it's 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 developing very quickly, um, and uh, sustainability is still hasn't, you know locked in there but it hasn't locked in you know anywhere in, in a big in a big way but you do have some really wonderful wins to show that sustainability is working and it's and I can see how you and reef check are, are, are connecting these dots the the uh, corners of the triangle to make it happen it's it's very exciting I, I'm I'm so glad we had this chance to uh, to talk and to spread the word about reef check. Now, okay, how, you're in over 80 countries. How do other um, operators, um, how do they get involved in reef check? What do they need to do? Um, to my knowledge, all of the different international reef checks, all of the different country offices have their own uh, web presence. So Google reef check, um, find out where they are, or look at the Reef Check Headquarters H, uh, no, the Reef Check Headquarters uh, website, which is reefcheck.org, and they're based in LA, and they have the names of all of the coordinators in all of the countries, uh, and you can find that there, and then you write to the local coordinator, and they can help you out if they've got a program on it. Wonderful. Well, listen, Julian. Again, thank you so much for staying up late. <laughs> I bet you want to get get some shut eye. Uh, it's a twelve hours difference. So again, thank you very much for being with us, and uh, keep up doing the great work for our beautiful reefs. Thanks so much. Music